Looks like we're getting going here. While we're getting going, just place a little bit of music. And while we're waiting on everyone to join here, I'll play a little bit of music uh, just for uh, some background here. Get that going. Give it a couple minutes. Do you have uh, everyone green, been watching the, the other virtual hangs? Say what? Is that Green Day, I hope? <laughs> no, it's not Green Day. It's a, it's a friend of mine. Uh, it's a track that he, uh, he let me use for today. It's a band called Distant Mirror. Cool. But Green Day would have been an excellent choice. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Yeah, and now that I th now that I think about it, that first album of theirs would have come up uh, during Jeff's uh, portion of the talk, but we'll get to that. All all these elusive. Uh, references here, but it don't make sense in the long term. All right. Well, while we're going to get, uh, let's just go ahead and get going here. I will cut this music right here. Let's end that. Uh, DJ Stacy uh, put in the curtail to it. There we go. All right, guys. Thank you very much uh, for joining today. Thank you all out there. So. I'm going to open it up. There hasn't been a whole lot of talk about greenwashing at all, really, um, regardless of crowdfunding or not. So what the hell is greenwashing? Excuse my language. So greenwashing is any false or misleading claim made by uh, a company about its products or itself uh, to intentionally or unintentionally uh, be deceptive uh, in the minds of consumer to prop up uh, their eco and environmental friendliness in the minds of consumers. So with that said, with that definition out there, just so we're now all on the same page, I'd like to introduce our panel here. So we have uh, Isabel Agard from Last Object. We have Eli Marmar from uh, WindQuest. We also have Jeff Meyer of Climate Guard and Johnny Appleseed. We have Inketsu Okaina over here who gets the True Blue Award for calling in uh, from Japan, the biggest time difference on the panel. And then we also have James Whitfield of Brie. Now, before I bring everyone in, all right, I want to set the stage a little bit uh, because everyone should be on the same page about the way this panel is going to work. I don't uh, so the panel will work with I'm going to set the stage myself. I'll bring in the panelists themselves individually so we can talk about each one of their campaigns specifically uh, because they're all doing great work and they're all super cool and they contribute uh, to the sustainability movement um, in great ways. And then from there, we'll talk about greenwashing and sustainability. And then we'll close with some tips on how to crowdfund with purpose. And if we have time, uh, well, we will answer uh, any question, or we will answer any questions. Uh, do a little small Q and A if there's time. So, with that said, allow me to set the stage. Let my words uh, be the palette that paints the imagination here. So, I had originally planned up a very large uh, preamble to this, and I'm something of a uh, analog man in a digital world. And I was going through it last night. And since I write in ink, um, my hands were very blotchy. I was wondering, am I some kind of ink monger? Uh, what's going on here? I was essentially so deep into it that I uh, was honestly about a blotch away uh, from really wondering, is this a Rorschach uh, for my self-committal here? But uh, <laughs> I digress, so, and I'm just kidding right there. But I just want to set the stage by saying uh, this is not going to be any kind of indictment on uh, greenwashing and crowdfunding here because ultimately I want everyone to know that um, crowdfunding is not a, uh, well, greenwashing and crowdfunding has, there's been limited study on it 
And what has been found is that there is a majority of campaigns uh, are a high risk of greenwashing. So it's very much worthy of talking about. And moreover, uh, it's more worthy to talk about because it also, it contributes to raising uh, campaigners, raising more funds. But here's the problem, and this is why I wanted to do this, because it's in everyone's best interest, not only that they know what it is, for instance, and that it does contribute to raise more funds, but also it has the potential uh, to hurt uh, the campaigners and the companies that they are forming, uh, because if they use greenwashing and they set an expectation of you know, getting um, of a product being more eco-friendly than what it actually is, then this perception, whenever the backers get the product, could potentially harm their own brand down the line. So I want to make for sure everyone knows this. And also, I want to contribute and set the stage to why crowdfunding is important to the sustainability movement at large. And it's because sustainability uh, you know, historically, these entrepreneurs have been um, boxed out of traditional uh, funding avenues like uh, banks and uh, other avenues. And in turn, crowdfunding to move forward to really get to a carbon neutral future uh, that we all desire, crowdfunding is going to be integral because it's going to empower the movement and it's going to empower these uh, entrepreneurs and their ideas uh, for us to get there uh, by serving as an alternative means of finance. And so with that said, that preamble, I should note, uh, much shorter than the one I had envisioned for last night. But with that said, let's move on to what we're all really here for, and that is to discuss crowdfunding with these great entrepreneurs uh, that we have on this panel. So I'm going to go through everyone individually. We'll talk about their campaigns, and I'm going to do so in alphabetical order. And there is, in terms of alphabetical uh, order, uh, there is something known as aardvarking in politics, uh, where the person uh, with the first name on the ballot uh, wins at an X percentage amount of time, and it would be harder to out aardvark Isabel Agard. You have four names, uh, four A's in your uh, name there, Isabel. Do you, if, if I were to look at your, if I got your name on a Scrabble rack, I would say, what am I doing with four A's? But I digress. So Isabel, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, um, and it's actually only in, in the state that's a positive because um, when I, I went to school there, I was always named first, but here in Denmark, I'm named last because it, it's the opposite. It's the last um, <laughs> in our alphabet. <laughs> so. Oh, interesting. I like that fun fact. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah well, um, well, I am a co-founder and the designer of Last Object, which has a mission to simply eliminate single-use items. So this is a huge mission, but we're doing it one product at a time and creating reusable alternatives to single-use items. So we started our journey with a reusable cotton swab in, in both makeup and, and ear cleaning area. And, uh, and then we went to tissues and uh, cotton rounds. And we, are, we keep going into the, the toilet sector, which is very, very, fun and disgusting, so. <laughs> well, I yeah, I personally um, have an association with you guys' products. Uh, um, one, of my, one of my former roommates, she would use uh, the last object, the, the uh, makeup scrubber, and it works, fin yes, yes. Except for hers, I believe, was in uh, Dragonfly Turquoise, which we'll get to here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I personally can say from anecdotally, great products and they do work quite well. So, you know, your most recent, when we were talking about, it, you have so many great campaigns, you guys have done them, uh, most recently a, uh, non-medical grade mask, but you know, you, we talked about which campaign you wanted to talk about, and that would be the single use tissues. So tell me a little bit more about that campaign. Yes, uh, it was our second campaign, and 
I think what I really loved about this campaign, what I really loved about this product is that it kind of grows on people. Uh, the swab has has a, has gotten a really good reach and it was our first and we got a really good blast on that. Um, and, and this is really something that people uh, don't buy immediately, but they buy it the second time and they love it. So I think it's really fun to take this on, um, on this discussion board also because tissues, as we know, have a lot of packaging. And, uh, and that's something that has been talked about and is something that we know is something that's really being greenwashed right now. So, um, so this is eliminating a lot of, of, uh, of packaging. Yeah. And we're going to get to greenwashing and uh, the packaging, our own packaging concerns here in a moment, whenever we open the discussion up to uh, the panel at large. But, um, you know, the thing about uh, the packaging and what I like most about uh, the tissues is that there are six tissues in uh, that one right there. But that six uh, those six tissues uh, account for 2,800 uh, single-use tissues being taken out per person uh, per year. And that is an astonishing amount. And then not only that, you have the dyes that are eliminated and all the other, the packaging as well. Um, uh, that's also uh, taken out of the environment as well. So tell me a little bit more about the colors that they all come in as well. Because they go, the colors are all for uh, a good cause here as well, because uh, they're named after what, in uh, five endangered species, is that correct? Six, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have like, we have six main colors um, okay. and they started with the first campaign and they kind of just followed the next campaign. And it, was, it wasn't it was even me, I, I just did the colors. And then uh, people started talking actually after, uh, while we were doing the, uh, the crowdfunding. And they asked, you know, what, what are the colors? Why, why have you chosen those colors? And then yeah. I was like, oh, we need to name them. And then I did just, I just talked on social media. Should we name them something? And then all of these amazing people, and they didn't even have a product yet. We're starting to name them. Oh, they should be after the oceans. Oh no, they should be after um, endangered species. And that's where that came up. So every single color is, 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 is um, referencing a specific species. So not just the whales, but a specific whale species that is being uh, or instinct or getting to really close instinction with them because of pollution. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, that pollution right there and it is something that uh, I believe the tissues I saw on your campaign is that the tissues uh, pollute uh, nine billion uh, gallons of water, and it's extreme. That is extreme. I personally have cut out. I I really like almonds, and I personally have cut out almonds out of my life because the one each almond is one gallon of water. That's nine hundred billion gallons. That's a that's a lot, and uh, I personally am very uh, grateful to have saved that water. And last object as well, because I very much like what you guys are doing. And we'll get, we'll discuss it in more detail here in a moment, especially that packaging. But it, let's move on here uh, to my friend Eli. And Eli of WindQuest, he is the author of this book that is not, does not come with an iPad. But uh, Eli, how are you doing, my friends? Doing well, Stacy. Thanks for including me. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit about WindQuest and just tell me a little bit about the book and we'll start there. All right. Um, uh, I've always been in the creative fields. I'm a, I'm a product designer, um, kind of morphed also into graphic design and marketing and branding. And I've got um, two young boys, um, six and nine. And so over the last, you know, nine years, I've just read countless stories to them and told them countless stories at night to put them to sleep. And um, it just it just made me fall in love with stories again um, and the creativity of, of the writing behind them. Um, and so I just, honestly, I just was finding myself driving in the car during the day, even without my kids and the stories kind of just started forming. And then when, when this idea of one quest 
um, came to me and I said, okay, this is something that I actually have to sit down and commit to writing to because it's just too much fun. Um, and uh, what I felt was really missing was um, kind of a, a contemporary spirit quest for kids. Um, it could really reconnect them to sort of the mystical side of life and reconnect them to the beauty and wonder of nature um, in a way that I felt was sort of missing out there. So that's the concept behind the book. And then there's, there's a lot of um, sort of sustainable aspects to what we're doing that we can talk about too. Yeah, we'll get to we'll get to the sustainability aspects uh, here in a moment. But you know, just you know, earlier uh, we were talking about how uh, there are plenty. Everyone out there wants to be an author. So just tell us a little bit more about your process and what went into this book. Yeah, um, I mean, it's not for the faint-hearted for sure. You know, I I thought it might take. Once I started, I thought it might take me about six months to write the book, and um, I'm coming up on solid two years now and really just sort of winding down the last chapter right now um yeah. i mean granted that that process could be different for other people but this is about a 175 page adventure novel um for for elementary school kids and so writing and, and editing and rewriting it's um it's a serious undertaking and with kids at home you know i'm writing usually from 11 at night on um, i'm a night writer as well yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, it's, a, it's a commitment, but it's a really, really powerful process. And I think even if I never published the book, um, I would have never regretted doing it. Um, and now that I am publishing it, thanks to Indiegogo and all our supporters, um, it's, a, it's really a thrill. And I just can't wait to get the actual physical book in, in the kids' hands. Yeah. Well, you know, let's talk about that, uh, that physical book right there, because uh, it's made with sustainable printing. So what does that mean exactly for the uninitiated out there? Sure. Well, like, like we talked about uh, the other day together, you know, sustainability is, is definitely a spectrum and a process. And I think for me, it's all about taking the positive steps towards leading all of us in our society to being more, susceptible, more sustainable. Um, and so the steps we're taking are there's sort of three steps, I would say. The first one is that the content of the story really, um, there's, there's many aspects of the story that's intended to educate children about connecting to nature, respecting nature, respecting resources, using what's around us. There's a lot of plant medicine in the story. Um, so that's one aspect. And also the family and the story is living on a sailboat, which is a, a pretty darn sustainable way of, of living. Um, and then beyond that, um, the printing is, is sustainable in, in, in a process sort of way. Um, we are, we're starting with a hardback, um, in many ways doing an ebook, I guess you could argue would be more sustainable, but for us, a big part of the project was to sort of help our kids digitally detox after these last couple year or, or more. So we really wanted to start with a physical hardback that the kids could hold. Um, and not be in front of a screen. But we're using, um, we're, we're sourcing two different papers right now. We're still gonna see how it plays out. One is a hemp paper um, from a Canadian paper manufacturer named Mohawk. Um, and hemp's really incredible because I think in one acre of hemp, you can produce 10 times more paper than in an acre of trees. Um, and also like so many of these other things, the amount of water and fertilizer and pesticides is significantly, significantly reduced in growing hemp versus trees. Um, and you can just imagine the, the weight and the, the truck transportation and everything around trees versus hemp, there, there's no comparison. So um, we're shooting for hemp paper and um, we do have a plan B in case that doesn't work out. We are gonna use a, a post-consumer recycled um, tree-based paper if the hemp doesn't work out. A lot of printers are, are, don't have the technical ability to work with hemp yet. So that's something that we're navigating. Um, and then the third aspect is that um, proceeds from the book are gonna support two different nonprofits. One is around um, marine conservation, specifically around whales. Um, and the other, because there's a, um, one of the main characters in the story is a narwhal. And um, the other nonprofit is around climate refugees and the way climate changing is forcing people 
either you know off their land or having to find new ways to live um, on their land. So um, those are the three main things that we're doing. Oh man, yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing all that. And sure. there are a couple of things that I do want to touch on. Is as someone, so my childhood, I grew up being fascinated by the universe at large, just like mostly through conduit of just like, you know, strange tales and, you know, to a marine time strange tale, like the Philadelphia experiment would get me and just these things that would captivate your mind. So I very much like the mysticism here. And to continue with that theme, you touched on something that is one of my favorite X-Files quotes about uh, respecting nature. So uh, it's, uh, I, man, I'm, there's going to be some people out there on r slash x files that uh, will make fun of me but i forget the exact number uh episode number but it's quagmire so it's season three and um season three scully's uh talking about her uh how she grew up and her father uh told her uh taught her to respect nature because it sure doesn't respect you. So I, I very much like that you're teaching kids to respect nature. And it's very much in line with my own, uh, uh, well, well, with my favorite X-Files quote. So thank you. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to move on here. So we got next up, we have uh, Jeff Meyer over here from Climate Guard. And he himself is an author, uh, he's written, this book here, America's Famous in Historic Trees. He also owns uh, the right, what is the name of the exact tree, Jeff, for Johnny Appleseed? You're on mute. So the last tree that Johnny Appleseed planted in the 1840s, we, um, I started working on in 1991 and actually saving uh, the genetics from that tree. And, and now you can, actually plant a tree that you'll get an identical apple and app, you know, from the tree that he would have planted in the 1840s. And for people that, you know, want to kind of get back to the way things were, apples were very different. Uh, they were, they, they weren't bred uh, for shelf life. Uh, they were meant to be eaten pretty much, you know, right off the tree. And, and so it's, it's a very, very, you know, a different experience, but it's a lot of fun for children to they learn about Johnny Appleseed in school to actually be able to plant one of his trees. So that's kind of how the namesake, you know, for Johnny Appleseed Organic all started. Yeah, that's that's amazing too. And Johnny Appleseed Organic also, uh, it can, well, some of the funds from Climate Guard, which is live on Indiegogo right now, uh, contributes back to Johnny Appleseed, right? Organic, is that correct? Well, what we do is we are, uh, primarily obviously trying to explain to people a very a technical subject about the food chain and you know that just because you're organic for instance doesn't mean we're, you're good for the environment uh, we try to teach a little bit about biotechnology uh, through you know basically making your soil biome come alive uh, when I was growing up and that was back a long time ago uh, but in the 50s and 60s, when you dig in the earth, there'd actually be worms and the earth would be full of life. Well, if you go I've out- I've heard of worms. Yeah, you have. <laughs> so you, you, won't find any, you won't find any worms. So what we're trying to get, you know, the soil is, a, it, there's as much life or should be as much life in the soil underneath the soil as there is on top of the soil. And- through many, many decades of using synthetic fertilizers, um, you know, a lot of that soil biome has, has been, you know, has died. And, and we're trying to explain to people not only how to bring it to life, but also, you know, what is in the food that they eat. So if anybody's listening to this podcast, to this the Zoom today, and I will say I've launched 23 companies in my career, the first time anything on the internet, first time anything with crowdfunding, so I'm learning, but anybody that's listening today, the high, high odds are like well over 95% chance that if you are using an organic fertilizer, you are growing your food using dead animal parts. And what we've learned from the Indiegogo campaign is that really resonates with people. They don't understand that. They don't really read the level, lay, label. They don't think about, oh, well, where did feather meal, meal, you know, meal come from? Or where did fish emulsion, which is uh, for the people that the first two people interested in the ocean. So you think about it, um, they have these large boats and, and nets and airplanes and they net tens of millions of small fish. 
which take them then out of the food chain for the bigger fish, the bigger fish, and the bigger fish, and they make fertilizer out of that. Now, now why should that be a good thing? Like, I think that's a terrible thing. And, you know, so, so we make out in this whole greenwashing thing that, well, fish emulsion is really good, but you don't actually explain to people where did the fish emulsion come from? Or when you eat beef or eat pork, do you ever wonder where the, the entrails or the guts or whatever you want to say, the viscera, I don't even know the technical word states that you probably do for it, but where is that? I love that you think that it, I know the technical it, word, by the way. It goes into fertilizer. <laughs> fertilizer. People are just, and, and, and again, I'm talking high 90%. So like we, there's our fertilizer, uh, which is the you know, biodynamic climate guard, right? And as, as well as I think there's one other. And, and so if you're a vegan or vegetarian and you're saying you don't want to eat animals, well, the high likelihood is you're, for, if, and you're growing your own vegetables, high likelihood you're growing them in animal parts. So a lot of, we do, of what we do is education and content and try to really explain, and I won't talk much more, but the idea of a truly sustainable um, product from not only the packaging, which is important and probably the hardest part for, for, for the fertilizer business, uh, but how, all, how are all the ingredients sustainable and how, how do we deliver those, this, this product to people at home with and making sure that we're always measuring our offsets. So when you said, does it support Johnny Appleseed? It does, it supports our climate farm where we're taking several hundred acres of worn out soils and, revi and, revi and reviving those soils through the application of our product and through uh, climate farming techniques to actually store carbon in the ground. And really the, probably one of the best ways in the, in the, in the, that we can do something as a consumer is start demanding more regenerative uh, grown uh, crops and more climate farmed crops at the grocery store that actually use techniques to lower the nitrogen runoff into our waterways and store carbon in the soil because uh, agriculture you know, is a you know, major you know, component um, of greenhouse gases and of, you know, of climate change. Yeah, and First, I have to have it. You know, we all eat every day. So it's yeah, a big, big target. Absolutely. And, you know, you're talking about this uh, issue of carb carbon sequestration, uh, which is just something that I personally have been learning about in the last year. So I, I like uh, very much that you touch on that. And that's, I think that's going to be a larger issue moving forward uh, to the sustainability movement. I am curious about um, one thing about what the beneficial fungus that you guys include in your uh, in your mix, what um what kind of fungus and how is that beneficial? By the way, well, we I think we have about eight or nine different fun funguses and bacteria. So some some of the bacteria, for instance, fix nitrogen in the in the ground and the roots. And so when we harvest uh, our farm, we leave a certain amount in the ground because if you think of what that does is that then creates food for next year's crops. So some of the, the, the bacteria will actually fix the nitrogen in the roots in the ground where the ground then can store carbon. And so one thing about our fertilizer that is really, really important, but it's not an easy concept because we live in a society that everybody wants everything right now is the more you use it, meaning over the longer period of time you use it, every single year you're going to get more productivity because it doesn't just die and go away. Those bacteria, the fungi, the mycorrhiza all stay in the soil. And if you think about it, it's just like when humans get good nutrition, we tend to stay healthier. So we don't use any pesticides or herbicides at our farm at all because the fact that our plants are so healthy from the fungus and from the bacteria and from the mycorrhiza in the, in the soils, they tend to then fight off a lot of the disease problems that other that typical farms would have. I see. I see. I, I very much, as someone who's from Oklahoma, someone who's a student in history, uh, but you're talking about making sure that the soil is uh, beneficial year after year, which was very much a contributing factor to the Dust Bowl 
way back when. Um, but that's a whole different conversation about FDR and uh, New Deal, New Deal politics themselves. But we got to move on. Got to move on. So we have our friend, the panel's true blue, Inkatsu Okina over here. How are you doing today, Inkatsu? Doing good. Yeah, good, good. So Inkatsu, just for everyone who's uh, out there watching, Inkatsu uh, will be launching a great new power station on Indiegogo later in the year. I personally uh, have known Inkatsu. He's very passionate about sustainability. And yeah, give us give us the 30 second elevator pitch about uh, Q. Okay. Tell us more, my friend, oh, tell us yeah. more. So since I'm not in the office, I cannot show you the actual product, but I took a pic. Oh, you don't see it. <laughs> it's very difficult okay. to see against that lovely okay. background, my I friend. I could show, but basically uh, you can see the product in the background. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a little a box thing in my background, and that is the cube. Uh, we are developing this product, and we are producer of a carbon battery. Oh. Yeah, there we go. This, this, this. <laughs> so what's special about our battery is that uh, we have a special technology to make any organic materials into a carbon. And we, we are the only one who can do this in the world. And we use this carbon material to make this battery. Yes. yes. And we make uh, the cube. Um, the, The selling point of the of our battery is that, uh, by the way, this is the notorious 18650 conventional lithium mine battery. Explosive, uh, two to, every two to three years, you need to replace it. Um, and uh, it uses a cobalt and nickel and manganese, those rare metals that cause some problems in some regions of the, on the planet. And our battery do not use those rare metals in electrodes. So uh, basically by using our battery, um, we can eliminate the needs of those uh, notorious activities in the world. And not only those sustainability aspect, um, our battery has quick charging capability because our carbon material has a bigger particle than other material. So that's why oxygen in the battery would not leak into the electrolytes when it is get, uh, when it gets overcharged or gets external pressure. And I'm going to show you this. Oh. Okay. Oh yes, do you show. So this battery is, basically I broke this battery last week. And usually you cannot do this with this battery because once you break it, it's going to explode and you are going to get injured. But yeah. because our battery is so safe that you can just, I didn't put any uh, safety equipment, um, I just uh, nail it. and. Yeah. It broke and it didn't make any smoke and, and it did not make any frame. And that's why uh, we can put 20 amps into this battery. This battery accepts only two amps. That's why we can quick charge our cube 10 times faster than other lithium ion battery. How, so, long, yeah. how long will it take for a complete charge in Ketsu? Uh, uh, so we have two versions. We have uh, one, so basically 990 watt or one kilowatt sure. and uh, 1,400 watt hour or 1.5. And for one kilowatt, uh, it takes about uh, 40 minutes to charge. And for 1.5 kilowatt, um, it only takes 60 minutes to charge. 60 minutes, that's amazing. Usually um, other, Portable stations, they take six hours, eight hours, nine hours to fully charge. And that's why they're big. And they're not very portable because they are so big that you cannot really carry. But we chose yeah. one kilowatt and 1.5 because we can quick charge our application. It doesn't have to be like big and heavy because sure. it's big and heavy, it's not portable. And we How are- heavy, as, as kind of a tiny, 
tiny, I don't, I don't want to use perhaps petite, or I'm okay with calling myself petite. I, I, as a petite man, how heavy is it? Is it? How portable is it is what I want to know. So basically on the market, uh, 10 kilowatt, uh, one kilowatt means about 10 kilograms. Okay. And two, two kilowatt is about 20 kilograms. So okay. if like other um, competitors are like 20, kilo, uh, 20 kilowatt and 20, 30 kilowatt, and they are like 20 kilograms, 30 kilograms. And for guys, I think that's okay. But for uh, ladies, I think it's not very really portable. And in our case, because we chose 10, uh, one kilowatt and 1.5, the weight will, will, will be around uh, 10 kilogram to 15 kilogram. And we have, we have a design of like, you know, you can uh, carry it with both your hands or, you know, if it's uh, so light, you can just carry it one hand. We, ha we have that special design on the package. Excellent. And very quickly, Inketsu, uh, before we move on to James over here, brief, because we're uh, butting on time here. But uh, how, how much battery life can you get from that one charge? How long, uh, how much battery? So uh, I'm just to give you like a, a number because that's, oh, there's a two, 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 two aspect for battery life. So one aspect is, you know, for one charge, how many uh, minutes or hours you can use. The second is, how 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 many years the battery lasts, and for how many years we have a uh, eight thousand times of life cycle. Usually, like this eighteen six fifty has a uh, five hundred to one thousand five hundred life cycle at state or charge twenty percent. And I, I'm not going to get into like too much of details, but um, basically, uh, because this one is. 500 to 1,500, and we have uh, more than 8,000 times. So actually it, it is more than 10,000 times. I see. But, um, so five to seven times. So we expect more than 10 years of battery life. And for one kilowatt of battery uh, storage, uh, you can uh, charge 100 cell phones. So imagine if you are in a, disaster situation and you need to supply energy to too many people with the current battery storage uh, with one kilowatt basically you can supply 100 smartphone but it takes about eight to two nine hours to charge which means in one day you can only supply energy to only 100 people but because we can charge within one hour and one kilowatt can supply 100 people with our password uh, in a disaster situation, we can supply 500 people. I see. Ingetsu, thank you so much for sharing this, inf sharing this information. Uh, if to the viewers out there, there's more information and some links shared uh, by one of our, uh, by Indiegogo itself, by one of my, our, my colleagues in the chat, be for sure to check that out. Also be for sure to come back to Indiegogo, not that you want it, already because i'm sure it's saved to your browser as you're in your browser's bookmarks bar but come back in ketsu uh will be uh launching a campaign later in q3 this year and we'll also be picking that conversation up and uh to the man i will be moving on here to the man james whitfield of breathe and i have to say james uh you are your patience here very much appreciated going last as someone who has a very loquacious nature, I think it'd be very, very challenging for me to sit here and uh, not say anything. But James, how are you today? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, fine, thanks. Excellent. So tell me, give me the 30, 30 second uh, elevator pitch about Brief. <laughs> okay, yeah, so Brief. I mean, we originally set out with the goal of uh, re-engineering uh, consumer electronic products to make them more sustainable. Uh, Brief was the first product we worked on, and uh, in a nutshell, it's an air purifier that is green. It doesn't use any um, plastics in the traditional sense. It doesn't use any um, plastic air filters. Everything's biodegradable, 
um, or 100% recyclable uh, in, the, in, a, in a pure sense. I see, yes. Uh, you guys describe yourselves as the most sustainable air filter out there. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, I mean, we go for the, um, for the more circular economy uh, view on things. Uh, and we accept that uh, not all products are gonna be recycled because it's just not the way consumers work and it's not the way um, the world's up really because uh, we, you know, products are shipped internationally. So, uh, I mean, it's different even in the UK with uh, different recycling regulations across the country. So we've, Design Breathe to be fully sort of biodegradable. So not just the, the filters inside it, but the, the plastics, uh, the fabrics uh, are all quite from uh, hemp's uh, that are grown, uh, that's been mentioned already. Um, the plastics are all um, based around elephant grass, which is grown on non-arable land uh, and it's all can biodegrade, biodegrade back to um, sort of the, the biome uh, when it's, at the end of its life so yeah it's amazing and uh you guys you guys won the red dot award this year for design you know tell me a little bit of something about tell me a little bit more about uh the award and you know uh, what all you guys the efforts in design that you guys put into it yeah so it was a huge honor winning the red dot award because uh we're the, the two of co-founders, uh, myself and uh, the other designers here, um, we are uh, you know, product designers by nature, so been around the Red Dot Award for quite a while, but never never really won one before. Um, but the, the aim with Breathe was to create a sustainable product that also didn't necessarily look like a sustainable product. So the aim was to create a, a something that's beautiful that you can have in your home. Um, and the first thing you think of is that that's a great looking product, um, not, oh, that's a sustainable product. Yeah. Uh, so that was always our, our driving goal uh, to make a, yeah, something that people actually want to own and then uh, mm -hmm. sustainability would come, come as a, an added bonus in, into that, that that's not necessarily they're buying into uh, initially. Um, but that was really important for us because we, are, we were trying to tackle um, sustainability from like the consumer, consumer end uh, and under the understanding that we're not in a perfect world, but we're trying to um, bring it, bring, bring technologies forward that um, wouldn't necessarily be used. Yeah. So, you know, earlier I was talking with Isabel about, you know, having a roommate that used the wipes uh, for her makeup. So uh, she also, the house, we had over a hundred plants in this house. So, and we also had an air filter in the air filter. If we had known we we should have had a brief is what we should have had in all honesty because the plants they were everywhere uh i kind of felt like there was a degree of um a residential jungle uh in a way <laughs> they're just all, all over the place but the great thing about uh brief aside from taking out six thousand tons of hepa filters per year uh that thrown away that this contributes to uh mitigating that number but also the uh, that one breve accounts for three thousand and forty three house plants. Is that right? So yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we love plants as well. We're not like we're not trying to uh, discredit the, how great plants are or anything like that. Trust um, me, I'm not trying to discredit plants either because um, I don't know if you guys know uh, and knew this, but yeah, they're kind of amazing. I, and uh, I say that I thought I had a better joke. In my mind, did not. I'm just going to call myself out on that one. But uh, so, but yeah, I too love plants. And if we had one of those, uh, you know, I perhaps might not have felt like I was living in a residential jungle as I so described it. But all right, guys. So now that we have everyone and we everyone's had a chance to share a little bit about their campaigns and how great they are, because everyone here is doing super cool stuff. Let's, I mean, let's open this up. At the top of the conversation, I had mentioned greenwashing and I defined it. Uh, my last name is not Webster, but I chose to uh, define it at the top. So now let's have a broader conversation about you know, greenwashing and some examples that might bring it home uh, for the viewers out there. And uh, the first one that I have here is, this is a pretty good example uh, 
of greenwashing, I think, uh, because right here, it's from my dry cleaner. I won't say uh, my dry cleaner's name because they're, they're wonderful people. I like them very much. But it's, it's packaging like this. You know, you care about the environment. We care about you. So they're using the environment to sell back uh, to you. And, you know, we care about you. Uh, another example that I uh, very much am reminded by is how recently Volkswagen uh, has been in the news for one uh, joking to change their name uh, about to Volkswagen, V O L T uh, S wagon, and then versus Volkswagen. Uh, of course, this is a company that has pled guilty uh, to uh, lying to and deceiving the EPA uh, around their own emissions. So this is an example that I think probably most people are familiar with. Uh, did anyone else on the panel have an example of greenwashing that they thought the viewers out there might be uh, familiar with themselves? I think the one thing that people that are really interested in sustainability need to do, need to realize that the word sustainability is not like a regulated word. So pretty much anything you have, you know, burgers from the burger place could be sustainable because there's an endless supply of them. So I, I do believe that, uh, and, and if you read labels, again, back to the fertilizer, it doesn't, you know, labels can be very deceptive and sometimes you just have to dig uh, deeper. There's something for fertilizers called an MSDS, which actually does list every little ingredient uh, I think we're just the second manufacturer of fertilizer in the country that's posting it on our website uh, because you have to dig very, very deep to try to find, you know, what the word natural means, what the word sustainable means, because these are words that I think just get and different colors get thrown about. Um, and if you really want to be dedicated to sustainability, you probably just need to do a little bit more due diligence uh, than just looking at the colors and reading words like natural sustainable, et cetera. Yeah. And that is, and to your point, Jeff, and that's something that I personally have thought about is that, you know, ultimately it's an issue of transparency to your point. Like, what do these words mean? You know, who's out there to, are there any third parties out there that can verify it? And then that gets risky because you ultimately can have a third party certif certifier and it's really, kind of meaningless in a way because who's the third party and in regard to crowdfunding you know there's so much in terms of an asymmetry uh between the backer and the uh a backer and the entrepreneur and the campaign itself in terms of what information is shared what's chosen to be shared and what's actually conveyed and i was curious you know Everyone here has a page on uh, Indiegogo. How, you know, what information do you guys, how did greenwashing and making claims uh, on your campaign page, how were those considerations accounted for in your campaign page and in the development overall, if you guys could share? Um, I think just quickly what I would say, Stacy, is, um, I think the good news is um, consumers are becoming pretty savvy. Um, I think we often tend to underestimate the, the savviness of the consumer. They can sniff out when something doesn't feel right. And so I think um, for all of us as campaigners or people watching that are thinking about launching a campaign, it's really like, is your sustainability message or your green message coming from a, a, an authentic, really deep value place? Or is this something that you're thinking about at the end of your process as like a packaging thing or icing on the cake to a product that you've already developed? If that's what you're doing, there's a really good chance that you are at risk or in the process of greenwashing because really if the core value of the, the, the company or the brand or the product is not coming from a place of wanting to protect the earth and do sustainable things, then there's a really good chance that it's not and you're coming from more of a marketing angle. Um, and that's really, it's an easy trap to fall into, even with well-intentioned people. And I think that's why when the statistic you threw out that yes, 
many campaigns are at risk of greenwashing because it's, it's a very easy trap for anybody to fall into. So I think you have to just be really honest with yourself and ask yourself, am I coming from a true intention, a starting point of wanting to do something sustainable? And if I am, then I'm on that path and maybe it's not perfect, but I'm in that process and I'm gonna to continue to refine as I go and I'm gonna be transparent about what I'm doing. And I think one of the really important things to do is be transparent about your failures to be sustainable also. Yeah. And that's really where I think you'll gain the trust of the consumer. If all you do is be transparent about your sustainability wins, um, that's one thing. But if you can be really transparent about the risks you've taken and the failures you've had and what you're doing to correct those failures, that's how you build trust um, with your consumer. I love that, Eli. Thank you for that answer. You touched on something that you know James and I actually were speaking about uh, yesterday, and you you mentioned that even the most well-intentioned individuals can fall into that trap. And James was sharing, and uh, now James, please don't share the the name of the company uh, just because it's local to you. But if you could describe. Um, Describe how uh, their best intention ended up uh, creating a perception of greenwashing. Yeah, so um, this is a, an example of a, a supermarket uh, here in the UK, a big chain. Um, so it's not like a small company that did this or anything, uh, but they are, what they set out to do was uh, improve the bee population in the country, basically. And they are, they, they went out and they um, released a lot of uh, honeybees uh, in, in, to sort of sum it up in a succinct way. Um, and it was, it was promoted by their marketing department. And uh, you can see it came from a good, um, that, you know, it, it came from a good standpoint originally because, uh, you know, the bee populations really decline. If we release more bees, there'll be more pollinators out there and it sort of solves the problem. But uh, it backfired a little bit because uh, the actual problem is um, the environments that the bees live in. Um, so by releasing more bees, it creates more competition for um, for the, the, the wildlife and the natural bees that are there that are in decline. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's one of those things where it, it was probably created by like a marketing department uh, within the company uh, and then didn't necessarily go and speak to experts and people who had the knowledge in the background to say, well, this is a great idea, but you should really do this. And it would have, it could have had a great impact, but it, I mean, it, would put in, it was never intended to be a greenwashing exercise, but that's how it, it sort of comes across to the, at the end of the day. It's just unfortunate really, but that's how easy it can happen. And those are big companies that do that, so. Absolutely. And yeah, they didn't intend to, and just anything around bees, uh, you know, there's such cool little creatures with their, with their waggle dance coming into the hives. And I believe that uh, precipitous drop uh, in bee populations uh, beginning at the start of the 21st century around the year 2000 uh, has been attributed to uh, chemicals in fertilizers, if I'm correct. Is that, is that correct, Jeff? It's primarily in pesticides and herbicides and really what Sorry. caused in a very, very quick, I'll tell it, explain it quickly, is that back then bees didn't move around much, right? But now bees are very mobile. So one month they're in California, one month they're in Canada, the next month they're in South Dakota on the sunflowers, the next month they're down in the citrus grove. So what's happened is that wherever they pick something bad up, it's no longer a very easy way. You can't control, a beekeeper really can't control what is bees, um, Pollen, they pollinate, right? Because when they go somewhere, the bees are hired hands for the farmer and those bees can go a long ways and bring really, really bad things back to the hive. And we could have an entire another hour on it, but it has more to do with the mobility uh, of the current bee population as opposed to anything else. It's primarily herbicides and pesticides. Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking about, you know, bees and uh, precipitous drop in their population. Uh, which that takes us to over here to Isabel in terms of endangered species. I'm not entirely sure, and hopefully not, that bees are not an endangered species given that they are uh, a keystone uh, species out there in terms of ecology. But uh, Isabel, if 
I hope it doesn't come to this, but if it did, we, you know, we, we need a seventh color out there for uh, uh, beehive honey, beehive honey gold, I suppose. But, yeah. you know, I, I want to get you in here, and Inkatsu, we'll get you in here most certainly, you know, feel free to get in here uh, when you can, or feel comfortable doing so. But, you know, I'm curious, you know, you've had, you've done so many campaign pages now, Isabel. Um, you know, what considerations have you, you and Last Object made around the design of your campaign page? And what do you feel is unique to the sustainability uh, campaign that, say, other campaigners wouldn't have to make? I would say Eli actually also got um, uh, talked about it really well. This um, notion about not just buying a product that's, oh yeah, and we're green, or oh yeah, and we also have this packaging, or we also have this little, little, but we really, the core of the product, the core of the mission of companies that that is focused to be um, sustainable. I think that's a really good start. So if you have a very simple and very direct product um, or a service that is directed to make the world a better place. I think that's a really good place to start because it is really difficult. Um, even though you have a really simple product, which is produced, you have to have it shipped, you have to have it packaged. And all of these little steps, all of these little parts of your company, you have to make sure that they're sustainable and that takes time. Even we've had bumps on the roads with the first campaign, the second campaign went better, third, even better, you know, and it's okay to fail, it's okay. Um, our first packages went out with plastic and we were like oh my god this is absolutely awful like we're <laughs> right we're trying to clean up and now we're messing it all up and and that's just because we didn't have the right partner with the shipping companies and and they couldn't they couldn't provide what we wanted which is just simply um, plastic free and uh, and then there's all these uh, rules in china and there there's so many it's so complex to be sustainable and it's becoming easier and easier. And there are more and more people that are aware. There are, uh, as James said, you know, just really amazing people that really actually are really specific and very, um, they, they think about what, what's going into the products. They ask questions. They ask me questions I can't even answer. And then I have to figure it out. And that's amazing because that makes, you know, everything elevate constantly. So, yeah. um, changing it up and we change our campaign page even throughout the campaign when we find out oh shit that material is actually not the best we can use right now we should use this material yeah um, so yeah yeah guys we're abutting on our time here we have two it's 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 two minutes to midnight uh as the saying goes but uh heck, uh, anyway, uh, can we all st stick around for a couple more minutes? Because uh, there's a lot of good stuff here. We'll get it landed. Can I? Can, do you guys mind giving me another five, five, ten minutes? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, because you know, Isabel, you were talking about the complexity of this issue, and uh, there's just so much to talk about. It's so complex this issue, and uh, no wonder we're going over time here. But one of the things that I do want to cite about, you know truly sustainable, truly, um, you know, environmentally friendly, you know, campaign uh, companies, and, you know, they do have something that is unique to them that other campaigners don't have in terms of the considerations. And that's the triple bottom line. And I know that uh, for some of you, that's a big challenge. And Inkatsu, is it, how does the triple bottom line play into uh, PJP and the uh, Q? Because I know, that from our previous talks that you guys very much do consider that in terms of making the world a better place. Yeah. So I think everybody talks pretty much I wanted to talk about. But um, the last thing I'd like to add is that um, there should be difference between like eco-friendly and sustainability. And eco-friendly, you know, uh, even in Japan, we had activity of eco-friendly, like a few years ago, government subsidized um, the product that has basically could be greenwashing, um, but anything eco was subsidized. And uh, I think sustainability should be different in a way that sustainability should be applicable to the future because people talk about sustainability and saying about this, this is the lithium ion battery. 
But this, the, when you talk about sustainability, I don't think it's just a green or a, you know, CO2. When we talk about sustainability, it should be how it is produced, how it is performed, and how it is going to be disposed or recycled. And I have a statistic saying that um, by US uh, Department of Energy, only 5% of lithium ion battery are recycled, even though it has a uh, rare metals inside. And the rare metal is increased, the price of rare metal is dramatically increased because of everybody talks about sustainability, EVs, robotics, many things, but people don't realize how it is uh, disposed because only 5% recycled, 95% is uh, either shipped to the developing countries or the, uh, in Japan, I don't, I don't want to say company name, but uh, in Japan, some car manufacturer is uh, burying this battery into the mountain and or shipping the used car to developing country. But as you know, <laughs> EV cars resale value because lithium ion battery needs to be replaced every two or three years is very low. So that's, I don't think using this battery is that sustainable, but people just take one aspect, like electricity is better than gasoline. So, you know, this battery is sustainable. No, because sustainability should be like production, performance and disposal, plus how it is going to affect the future. Because if it's not going to affect the future, then what, what is the meaning of sustainability? Because it is the development. So yeah, that, that's I, I wanted to add. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Inketsu, so much. And given that I had so many questions planned here on numerous pages because I'm fairly loquacious over here. But um, so I do kind of want to start wrapping it up here. I'm just going to pose this final question. And, you know, who I, I've got a feeling we all have, uh, you know, certain feelings. Um, but please share, you know, what can crowdfunding do? to be better uh, with sustainability and uh, moving forward. What out there do we could we do for crowdfunding? And then also any tips out there for um, sustainability entrepreneurs? I want to just agree with Eli. I think that if you're going to be sustainable, that you're going to be have to be willing to be very, very transparent. And it's a decision you've got to make before you even start your campaign. Like you can't come in the middle of your campaign and say, you know, it'd be really good. We'd sell more product if we could be sustainable. You've got to decide like from the beginning that I think you'd be much, much more successful and a lot less headaches and a lot less compromises. And it'll make the path, you know, a lot easier for you. So that would just be Kind of, I think sustainability has got to be part of, the, if you want to be that, have it be part of your brand. But I think it can, the knife can cut both ways because if you try to be sustainable right at the end, especially with social media and all being what it is today, I think it can really potentially hurt your company. It might have been better not to, for your company not to try to be sustainable at all. So that, that's what I'd say. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. One, uh, one thing, one tip I do want to throw out there for everyone that might be viewing in, you know, I'd like to get you guys' opinion as well. But just from my daily conversations with green tech entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general, I noticed that specifically in sustainability, that there tends to be a, um, an overall perhaps... Um, reliance on uh, influencers and going the influencer route. I personally would like everyone, I will very much want to vehemently dispel, uh, dispel this conventional wisdom because that absolutely should not be uh, the reliance here for you all. I want everyone to succeed and the best way to succeed is by creating an audience around your launch and getting out there and really doing the work, um, you know, using digital advertising uh, to collect email addresses, uh, and directing, using uh, digital advertising to direct traffic to a pre-launch page with a very strong call to action designed to collect those email addresses to form a launch, or excuse me, to form a community uh, around your launch. 
And uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, you all feel free to email me at stacy at indiegogo.com. And uh, from here, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of sign off here because we're already over time. And for Inkatsu over here in Japan, it's, uh, it's I think, uh, budding on four. But I want to first thank everyone out there that is listening, watching, however you're consuming this. Thank you very much for uh, attending. Uh, there's some great questions over in the chat that we will get to, I'm sure, on social, which brings me uh, to individuals within Indiegogo that I would like to thank uh, just for all the hard work that they put in that I personally saw this time around. This is my first time to do a... Uh, uh, a virtual hang at this level. And I just want to say, um, AK, uh, Brittany Classy, uh, Christine, Laura, uh, everyone else uh, that this touched upon, pretty much everyone at Indiegogo. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for viewing. And to everyone here on this panel, uh, thank you so much for your time. This has been a really great conversation. And uh, I've had a lot of fun today. So thank you all for your time here. And we'll be seeing you. Thanks. We'll Stacey. be seeing you soon. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah.